All right, welcome everyone to the Space Prize Speaker Series episode 14. It is August 17th, 2022. Uh, I'm really excited to be here at a special time with a special a guest and a special guest speaker. Um, my name is Mark Wagner though. I am the president of the Space Prize Foundation uh, and I am super thrilled to have with me today our guest host, Sarah Treadwell. Uh, who is uh, sitting in for Leslie, and uh, the two of them are off on an adventure soon, so perhaps we could talk about that too. Um, I'll introduce Sarah a little bit more in just a few minutes, uh, and then she will be interviewing Dr. Priyanka Rajkakati, and we are super thrilled to have her on, on the show. We've been working with her real closely uh, on Space Prize Paris, and uh, we'll hear more about her international background and more about her work as a scientist and engineer and space artist. Before we do, uh, I'll keep it brief, but I do want to say a few words about Space Prize for people who are joining us or watching the video for the first time. Uh, the Space Prize Foundation is dedicated to inspiring and empowering students, particularly young women, to pursue STEAM education, that's science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math, and to explore careers in the growing space economy. Uh, we do that in two ways. One is through uh, uh, attention-grabbing contests with spectacular prizes, and the other is through open education resources like uh, this speaker series. Uh, our first, by the way, I'm, I'm, I keep reaching for my, my, my mouse, but I've unplugged it because I wanted to uh, compete with Sarah's microphone here, and I just did a quick hot swap on my USB. But, uh, but our first uh, attention-grabbing contest was in Space Prize, New York City. Uh, we, uh, we worked with public schools in the five boroughs of the city. We had an essay contest and a video contest, and we sent finalists, 25 finalists, five from each borough, to a simulated mission to Mars uh, at the um, Challenger Center there in the city. We sent five winners to Space Camp's new uh, Lift Leadership Program in Huntsville, Alabama, and five of our winners actually uh, went on a zero G flight in May. They got to fly with Star Trek's Denise Crosby uh, and our own executive director, Kim Sharia. Uh, and it was a really fantastic experience for all of them. And all of the winners, including the space camp attendees are paired with a mentor who's an influential woman in the space industry for the next year. Uh, we're now producing a similar contest in Paris in fact, uh, thanks to Priyanka's help, we, we now have a winner who has not yet been announced. Uh, they'll be announced at IAC in September. Um, we also just recently announced the uh, Space Prize in Portugal uh, in conjunction with the first uh, person to go to space from Portugal on Blue Origin a couple of weeks ago. So we're really excited about that as well. And uh, in terms of other opportunities for open education resources that answer the question, what do we do for the girls that don't win? Uh, and for everybody else, uh, these are open to students, educators, and enthusiasts everywhere. We've produced a space education curriculum. It's an eight chapter online flex book, meant to be a, maybe a 12 week course. Uh, it could be an after school program, could be self paced, and that will be available at the end of this month. So ready to use in September. We're really excited about that, and we'll share more about that when the time comes. Uh, I should also, of course, share that my book on space education is uh, just now out, uh, available on Amazon. So you can learn about a handful of academic studies around how best to prepare students for this growing space economy and also for humanity's rapidly approaching multi-planet future. Uh, it also looks ahead to how we might educate students on the moon, on Mars, uh, and in deep space habitats like an O'Neill cylinder. Uh, explore some space philosophy, uh, looking at issues of ethics and governance and sustainability. Um, so kind of also an ambitious book goes hand in hand uh, with the curriculum, but uh, perhaps more meant for the, uh, the educators in the crowd. Uh, another program that we're doing that's open to everyone is this speaker series. We have already featured astronauts, engineers, scientists, entrepreneurs, designers, lawyers, historians, uh, and we have many, many more uh, coming. A space artist today, but uh, really excited about the schedule coming up and hope you guys will continue to join us. These are usually every Wednesday, usually at uh, 4 p.m. Pacific, although occasionally uh, for our guests' time zones, we have to make adjustments like today. Now, uh, while you're participating, please feel free to uh, participate in the chat, share you know your own ideas there, share reactions to what the 
the guest and the host are talking about, uh, ask questions. Feel free to use the, the raise hand feature or to physically raise your hand or, or even with a small group like this to unmute and interject uh, as long as it's not disruptive. Uh, we might invite you to share the screen. Sometimes the participants share uh, really cool stuff too. So happy to, uh, to hear from you guys during all this and definitely be prepared to ask your own questions. Um, ask any time. We'll, we'll also save some time at the end for uh, participant questions. Uh, if you do need help, just uh, ping me in the chat or use the help feature, which will more or less do the same thing. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that we do deliberately leave some wait time. So if you, uh, if there's a pause, we might be waiting for our guests to say more or waiting for one of you to say more. And, uh, you know, this being a remote uh, situation, don't want to jump in too early. So uh, th there may occasionally be a uh, be wait time. Now, any questions about any of the uh, the norms before we get started? Cool. In that case, I want to introduce uh, Sarah Treadwell, AKA Space Case Sarah. She uh, hosts the Space Case Sarah show on iRock Radio. And I think you will often find her on other shows there as well. Um, we're, we're really excited to have her. She, has, uh, she is also a scientist and a communicator. Uh, she is pursuing a master's in science communication right now and has let on today that she's applied to a PhD program. So uh, yet again, our guest host is, I think, someone who, uh, who might need to come back and be a guest as well someday. Um, like myself, though, she comes out of uh, English literature and creative writing, and I think that's appropriate for, and she's a musician, uh, I think it's particularly appropriate for um, interviewing today's guest, who is a scientist and artist herself. Um, so thank you, uh, Sarah, for jumping in and filling in for Leslie. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Yes, uh, I'm really excited to interview uh, Priyanka because uh, yeah, we both have a, a, an intersection, if you will, of artist backgrounds. So um, I will introduce Dr. Priyanka Rashkati. Rashkakati, sorry. Um, let me get to my notes here. So Dr. Priyanka is an Indian-born French space engineer and artist interested in the intersection of art, technology, and space. In fact, she has artwork currently on board the ISS via the Moon Gallery Project, which is her background, her screen right there. <laughs> and uh, of Asami's origin, she has traveled extensively, including a high sea astronauts simulation in Hawaii, looking for inspiration towards understanding how art and culture can contribute towards sustainable space exploration. With a bachelor's degree in physics from St. Stephen's College, Delhi, followed by engineering degrees from Ecole Polytechnique and ISAE Supero, she completed her studies with an industrial PhD from Safran. A co-founder of the exploration company, she is currently working in an advisory role for art and business development in India. And because she's not doing enough, in parallel, she is researching the socioeconomic dimensions of large-scale floods and space-based mitigation mitigation techniques from back home. So she's currently actively involved in STEAM outreach through channels like the SGAC, IAF, and Homeward Bound. And she has won numerous awards, including the Forbes India 30 Under 30 list and the 2021 Carmen Fellowship. Woo! That was a lot. <laughs> Welcome. It may be safe to interject that she is also uh, our local facilitator for the Space Prize Paris. Because she's not doing enough. <laughs> Welcome. I Welcome. Mean, we do. Thanks. Thanks so much for the intro. And we do have a lot of hours in the day. So <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> do we? <laughs> so yeah, like I was saying, we um we have kind of a similar interest in that we really love space and space science, but we also have this uh desire to be performers and artists. And so um we have some questions here. And I guess this is a really good place to start. Tell us your background about being a scientist and an artist. You know, um I started in music first and then went into science, but it seems like you might have had the flip-flop uh path where you started in science and went in, back into art. So that's actually not true. I did start oh. with design. <laughs> okay. Nice. So just to give a bit of a background, uh, I'm from India. I'm from the northeast side of India called Assam. It's where um, one eighth of the tea comes from. So the English breakfast tea is not really English breakfast. Oh, so, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
So growing up, uh, I didn't actually grow up in Assam. I grew up in uh, New Delhi, the capital of uh, India. And but I was always kind. My parents, uh, I'm really thankful that they made sure that me and my younger brother we were always entrenched in the cultural aspect of our backgrounds uh, growing up, uh, the Assamese culture. And I guess that sort of also influenced a lot of the way in which I used to think as a kid. Well, so I was that one kid who would do all the posters in the school, but was also good at math. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in Asia, um, especially back home in India, if you're good at math, it doesn't. It means that you're not going to, you know, start your career with an art degree. So, <laughs> <laughs> sure. but I, but I, I did, I did sort of. I applied to like a lot of things for school, and I got into this really cool design school called the National Inst Institute of Design, uh, which I did attend initially. I attended. I tried to attend the first year, but then I immediately realized that it was too early in my life to leave behind science because, you know, you need to. You need to learn the basics. You need to learn your math. You need to learn your uh, Gaussian curves. You need to uh, understand the basics of uh, analysis. So I left the design degree and I instead decided to pursue physics. And I was a good student. So I sort of went forward in that momentum. And, and then after physics, I decided to uh, delve a bit more into engineering because it was very hands-on. And so that's how I moved to France uh, to study at the school called Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, for the name, which is Polytechnique, means that you get trained in several different things. So, uh, yeah, so that's how I found myself uh, in science, actually. It's, the, the question should be, though, yeah, how, as an artist, how do you find yourself in science? And sure. um, so that's, um, and then I, Continued in that momentum with, you know, did a PhD, etc. And uh, and now I felt like that's I learned a lot of science, a lot of technology. And um, for me, I don't see a reason why if you study science, you have to stay in that field for earning your 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 money, you know, your day to day uh, uh, salary. Um, for me, science is just another way of expressing yourself. You know how Carl Sagan said that. Uh, we are just a way for the cosmos to know itself. So you have the science way of knowing yourself, which is very logic based, very structured, and everything else, which does not require you to answer why you're drawing something in that particular fashion. For me, that's the artistic bit. And I feel it's very important to explore our universe from both of these dimensions. And uh, so, yeah, that's my journey it's in, in art through science. And that's it culminated this year in February with this uh, piece of art on the ISS, which is currently there right now. It's going to be there till December. Which is amazing. <laughs> and yeah, that, and it's so true. I think that like so often we we pigeonhole ourselves and think that we have to just follow one track of, you know, yeah. oh, if I'm good at this, I got to do that. And if I'm good at this, I just need to do that. When really there's so much room to explore the whole range of of all those letters in STEAM. Um, and I'm so glad that you obviously got to do that too. So how did you get into creating space art? Like when was the, mo the aha moment of like, I'm going to make space art? <laughs> Uh, honestly, there weren't a lot of role models growing up uh, about on in about art in space. I mean, for me, space was really about rocket science and you know uh, sending astronauts or doing uh, astrophysics. And then um, it was actually during my my PhD when I was uh, PhD is that point in time when you start asking a lot of questions, not just about your research, but about life in general. existential questions yeah yes <laughs> especially when you're like you only hit that 25th uh, 26th year uh, anniversary and then um, I mean I can call it our quarter life crisis right <laughs> <laughs> I was not in my PhD with mine but go ahead <laughs> well it, it, it does it, it does re uh, retrain you to think in a certain way doing a PhD and uh, so I did ask a lot of questions. Uh, I was studying a lot of these models and um, and it was something I'd been doing even as a kid when I'd learned to code. 
Um, so the one example was when I, so this is the beginning of the story which led to this artwork in space. So I was learning to code and one of our uh, assignments was to, you know, come up, pitch a project, program it and get a grade. And everyone else was like, okay, database management systems, or you know, you're solving an equation, etc. And I was like, hey, I'm going to use this to create some artwork. And uh, so I started working on these uh, mathematical equations. Um, they're called hypotrochoids. What it is is basically a simple example of hypo hypotrochoid is the path of the moon, but around the sun. So around the Earth, it's almost like a circle, but around the sun is does something of the sort. So that's an example of hypertrochoid. But if you change the parameters, you get these, these really beautiful curves. And, uh, so I was experimenting with that. And I left it for a few years. And then back in my PhD, fast forward almost 10 years, I went back to it <laughs> during uh, my research phase. And then I found this call for artwork uh, by this project called Moon Gallery. Uh, and I discovered it during one of the IACs, actually, uh, the International Astronautical Congress, which is happening this year in Paris. And I attended the one, uh, and the Space Prize was actually linked to it this year because they're going to announce their winner for, for Paris there at the IAC. I'll be, I think it's going to be a great opportunity for the, the young girls who get to attend it. And so for me, back in 2018, I was... It was, uh, it was like a serendipitous occurring where I was just standing there, a newbie in the world of research, looking around me with all these cool people. You know, there was Bill Nye walking by. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, so, and I was like, okay, so there's all this technical stuff. What, where is the art? Like, I wish there was some more, something more artistic in, uh, in all of this. And then I just turned left and on the door it said, space art conference in 10 minutes. <laughs> Nice. And so I attended it. I got involved. I pitched my project. Uh, the project for this equation that I developed 10 years ago got selected. I developed it a bit more, added that story element to it. And while I had this, the first time in my life, uh, an artwork that I was actually pitching to an exhibition. And that exhibition was like space itself. So it was, uh, it was, it, it was like a, Tear, tearful moment for me. Aww. And uh, speaking about tears, uh, I mean, as a um, as a as an engineer, I've been part of some projects. Uh, for example, this CubeSat, which was already launched from the ISS uh, in 2017, and it was cool. It was like really nice to see it launch. But this year in February, when I saw the launch with my art inside, I was I was in tears. Oh. And it made me realize how much, how we connect way more to like a personal project that you can send to space, you know. So something that's been stuck uh, in my mind for a while now, how, how you can personalize your experience of space instead of just being very hardcore engineering, et cetera. You're reminding me of, um, you know, how Carl Sagan had to beg NASA to turn Voyager around to take pictures of, you know, the solar system selfie, because all the engineers were like, there's no scientific practical purpose to this. And there is so, there is something so unifying about art and the human expression, even in space and, and engineering and sciences. And, um, it kind of makes me think of a conversation I was having with someone recently about how some of those really early cave paintings have, you know, the outline of handprints, and there's no reason we have to our understanding why they would have done that other than just to express themselves. So it's something so innately built in us to express ourselves through art. And I think that that's so, you know, I can see why that would move you to tears. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip to this question quick because uh, you are kind of answering some of them as we go along. What were some of the obstacles or challenges in your career that you feel like you've had to face and how did you overcome them? Oh, as a woman, as an artist in the space domain, no challenges. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Let's move on. No. <laughs> <laughs> I see a lot of people laughing. In the <laughs> I love to hear your experience as well, by the way. So yeah, it, it was it was kind of, I mean, I, I turned 30 recently. So my second midlife crisis. <laughs> 
<laughs> but you, you know you feel calm once you hit that that you blow off those candles and um, so i was just reflecting on how you know i come from india i've grown up there i spent a good chunk of my childhood you know all the way to my uh, 20th birthday and you know india has a reputation of being not very safe for women etc but then i just realized that actually in india i didn't face that much of an issue it was you know that was you know a top student in a top school in a top college you know from a comfortable family background etc it's when i moved to france when i was suddenly pushed into this you know so yeah where i study it's a great school it's a but it's a military school and we don't have many women there so i was suddenly pushed into this category of one of the 15% women from a colonized country an artist you know the lowest grade that can be <laughs> so it was it was kind of a challenge to you know just um i mean it's a lot of thing a lot to handle at the age of something like 21 so i had to really defend my place as an artist and say that you know it's it's not that you learning you know learning science just for for science and actually a lot of the alumni uh, from this school and a lot of schools around the world you, you can also trace it back to newton if you like they didn't actually study you know a bachelor of science they studied natural philosophy or they studied these things which made them think and it was um so for me I, yeah today we have sort of started to categorize ourselves in you know science so even, even within science there's a research there's scientific researcher there's engineer there's technician so we I, i guess as a species we just love to categorize things and i was really not uh, cool with that because how do you categorize a human being everyone has these unique experiences and the moment you start categorizing is when you start having these issues uh, you know re- related to all these social issues we've been facing even even today uh, that we face because just because we love to categorize and so yeah one of my challenges was to uh break through such a barrier because not too many role models not a lot of support but just because you walk in saying okay you're an engineer and you, you also do art it does open a lot of doors so you do get a space to you know pitch about what you want to do uh and i think that also sort of helped me overcome some of these challenges and uh, one thing was also to try and make my art my own and not really copy other stuff but try to come up with my own thing and pitch it at different uh, exhibitions and residencies and of course another challenge is of course uh, being an artist with a science degree you're not actually taught a lot of the things that an artist would know if you, they went through art school uh, the business aspect of of art so that's something i'm currently figuring out if anyone is an expert in the panel please reach out to me we need to talk <laughs> yeah yeah very yeah um mark was saying in the comments here that philosophy and science weren't always separate disciplines or subjects in school and i think that's a really good segue into kind of a philosophy question if you will um i have a very non-traditional background that got me into science and doing science communication and uh a lot of it seems to always come back to philosophy and and thinking about how to communicate and what would you say is the best piece of advice you would have for people who are looking to get into the space industry the space economy working in this field because it's so broad than just you know study engineering and become an astronaut there's so much more to it now what would you say is a a good piece of advice for someone who's interested in becoming a professional in the industry so um firstly i think we are at that stage where the space industry is shifting from being a a field of study into a domain for applications so initially i used to study to study space to study rocket science to study astrodynamics etc but now uh, you don't even have to do that you just need to know some basics and then see how you can apply your field to that so you have medicine you have psychology you have art you have uh, business now with all this new space coming up with the 360 billion dollar economy that i've been reading everywhere and so i think piece of advice here is 
to really continue doing what you really like. And the space industry is so new that there are going to be applications turning up uh, for you to discover. And so just be really good at what you do and then see how you can make a very generalized approach to space into a niche for yourself. And here I actually want to add uh, that, I mean, it, at the end of the day, when you say, you know, qualified to work in space, what does qualify even mean? Like who's right. qualifying you? And what does it mean to be qualified? It is, you know, at the end of the day, it's not what, it's not just about what you bring to the table, but also how you can make it relevant to the, the others on, on the table and how you can fight for your place on that table. So I think a lot of creativity is going to be required for that because uh, we do fight, uh, we do face this challenge this uh, today about being forced to follow a certain section, but then you just have like 10,000 people doing the exact same thing. So you don't really have a, a niche uh, that you can use to your advantage. And sure. uh, so, yeah, the idea is to find uh, find the niche while still having a global idea of the whole industry. And the last point here would be, uh, I mean, yeah, it, here we're looking at how we can succeed in the space industry, but I, we are also at that point, and I say this because I feel very strongly about it uh, as an artist and also as someone uh, who has uh, who comes from an area that is suffering from you know climate change, etc. So that our success should not mean a failure for our planet. So we should also make sure that the current generation is aware of these. Uh, conversations on sustainability and uh, you know, diversity and all of these things that get neglected in standard education. I think we need to start giving more platforms for uh, such discussion, which is why Space Prize is a great thing. And, and Space Prize Paris, Mark, if you want to add, has a theme this year on on sustainability. So, yeah. Very true. I think that, you know, that, that some, some of the modeling and edu in our education systems is just so stuck in, in its ways. Like this is the way we've done it. And this is the way we're going to just keep doing it. And my, my relevant experience to that was being trained a classical musician, which, you know, um, it's Mozart and Beethoven and stuff that, you know, they're classics and they're great. And it's a great starting point, but then we break the rules and we learn different ways to perform music that breaks those rules. And, um, coincidentally, I've actually found a lot of, uh, weird parallels in science with music, um, particularly Western music, because that's what I studied. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure the students around me thought I was like so weird in my chemistry class. Cause I was like, Oh, you know how the, you know, like, a uh, a two atom wants to go down to a one. That's how a chord likes to resolute in music. And they're like, <laughs> What, what, what's wrong with this girl? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, Space Prize is doing this great, you know, tr and trying to advance education and, and give opportunities to students um, and young women. How do you think that we can help prepare students uh, all across the world for success in this, you know, rapidly approaching multi-planet future? How do you think we can do that? Um. I think we need to break out of this, uh, once again, this unidirectional linear thinking. And we need to have more cross-disciplinary training for everyone. And like you brought up, you know, uh, math and music. Yes, there's, there are a lot of parallels. In fact, I don't, uh, William Herschel, the, uh, the astronomer, I mean, he designed one of the most powerful telescopes of his time. He was actually a composer. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there is no dearth of art, artist, scientists. And if you actually look at some of the most uh, successful scientists, they always have some sort of an artistic uh, part to their training, like that. You know, I Einstein agree. was a violinist. Yeah. Uh, uh, back home in India, Dr. Homi Baba, he was, we call him the, the father of uh, nuclear science in India. He was a well-known painter. And even today, I mean, if you look at the ISS and uh, Thomas Pesquet, he played the saxophone, right, from from space. So, right. yeah, so I think it's very important to have this cross disciplinary training because it also trains your brain to think in a certain way. 
and yes. also gives you a bit more of empathy for the planet i feel because you're 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 seeing beyond just the equations you're seeing the planet for what it gives us how it sustains us and we don't have a planet b <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people think we're going to get out of here and be on Mars in 40 years or something but that's not happening. We're not terraforming Mars <laughs> in 40 no. years. Like I was actually Earth just explaining like, that to someone last night. Yeah. No. Nope. Yeah, it took it took like 3 billion years for the Earth to get here, right? For <laughs> to have the right kind of atmosphere for humans etc. <laughs> it's not happening overnight. There. I am just reading in the comments really quick here that bagpipes apparently made it to the ISS. So I, <laughs> that, huh. Okay. I didn't know that. I've always wondered oh, what's the, the biggest instrument that's made it up there. Um, so we are uh, going to be opening up questions to everybody soon here. So make sure you're thinking of some questions to forward on to our, our lovely guest, who is a, a lovely space artist who has art in on the ISS, what's next? Like, how do you top art going to the ISS? How, how do you, what, do you have any plans for, for your next project? Can you tell us your plans for your next project? So doubling back when I said I just turned 30 <laughs> and I was in a, uh, I was in that state where I'm asking myself questions again. And I feel like okay, I wanted to do art, now it's in space, etc. I wanted to be an astronaut as well, like who doesn't want to be, but with uh, all of these <laughs> space tourism, you know, opportunities coming up, which I hope will respect the planet, I keep going back to it. Um, I mean, I guess we don't even need to be uh, you know, a hyper-trained astronaut any, anymore to just go to space eventually. Um, and so... For me, I sort of took a backseat from a lot of this technical work that I was interested in. I'm, and right now I'm focusing a bit more on uh, more emotional aspects of my research. And so right now what I'm concentrating on is I'm going back to my roots. Going, I'm studying uh, Assam. Assam is where I'm from, like I said. And it's actually known for... Uh, not just for its tea, but also the worst flood situation on the planet. And uh, it's been getting worse over time because of climate change and uh, the erratic behavior is evident, not just in terms of where the floods are happening, but also the scale of the floods and the duration, the monsoon period is getting you know, haywire. So I wanted to also study how you can use space technologies for you know, just helping out with preparedness uh, with disaster management not just once the flood has happened but also how do you improve your early warning systems uh, etc and how you can use that for you know, influencing policies uh, for having better for giving a better chance to people to survive these floods and uh, yeah so that's my next step I'm looking and also creating an art project out of all this amazing satellite imagery that I'm looking at every day yeah that's super exciting and also, you know, I think that's a great thing to find something that gives you a little bit more personal meaning and purpose, because I, I don't know if other people listening have ever had this, like when you hit that culmination of something you've worked so hard for and it comes and it goes and you're like, now what, you know, uh, having something to pour yourself back into is always very helpful, at least for me. I'm also reading in the comments again, that the bagpipes apparently are still on the ISS. So I guess, um, I guess if we want to start a, a mutiny on ISS, bust those out because I am not a fan of bagpipes whatsoever. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think they're just bad. They're out of tune. Um, <laughs> but there are other instruments on board. Yeah. I, <laughs> so, um, yeah, if we uh, could ask, you know, anyone who would like to raise their hand, ask a question, go for it. We would love to hear from our audience and, and, you know, whatever philosophical question you might have. I did see that comment from whoever that was a little while back saying that philosophy was useless or not, not purposeful in school. And I got, I got words for you on that one, but. <laughs> oh, I think in uh, Liam is raising his hand. Unmute. Oh, yeah. 
Hello, <laughs> hi there. Uh, yeah, so uh, really excited for your project that's on the ISS. And um, a couple of questions about that. One of them is, um, yeah, that must have been quite a, an amazing thing to, to sort of get involved in that project. And uh, obviously to know that your um, artwork is, uh, well, a question, do you know how frequently that artwork is above your head? Because I can oh, show you. Six. <laughs> yeah, no, so the, uh, the ISS yeah. orbits 16 times yeah. every day, but not every one not of those always. orbits, it's yeah. above you. Um, and uh, I'm curious, a couple of questions. Have you actually seen your artwork in the skies above you um, as it's yeah. passing by? So you've done that. So I did, I do, I, I went to this app for the ISS tracking. I'm going to look up yours just after this <laughs> one because it seems even more exciting than just being told the coordinates where to look at. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I did it. I, um, I, I was, and it's, it's always like so exciting uh, to, to see that point in the sky, with a bit of your own skin cells because I made it by hand and I always ask myself, well, I'm like a pseudo tourist like a pseudo space right. thing because I do have my skin cells in space and as an artist I try to close my eyes and you know I try to create the link with that those cells that used to be a part of me at one point and I think that's very moving <laughs> I love that that's what that's what you bring to that moment um to me that that's that is what it's all about it's ourselves um okay. being connected to that disconnected point of light except that you can center yourself and realize that you are so connected to that um just just to give you a little bit of a an idea here you're in Toulouse right yes so this calendar is every single time your art is above you uh oh, that it's yeah. it shows um the next approximate two weeks and every hour of the day and wow. everywhere there is a big circle that means your artwork is going right over your head uh, and you'll see most of them are in the daytime right now the little circles means it's further you know it's lower in the sky closer to the horizon um and you can see yeah there's some visible passes coming up in about a week or so um mm -hmm. So th this is what the ISS above does. It actually gets you present to every time that oh, thing. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I'll send I'll send you that link uh, afterwards, so uh, so you can uh, so so you you'll have that calendar. But the other thing it does is every time your artwork is above. Uh, let me just I'll do it on this one. Every this is the ISS above. Every time the artwork is above, it oh let me switch it back to me and switch me back there so every time your artwork is above this thing does that oh yeah okay this, so yeah i, I read I mean, <laughs> yeah okay so, so that's that leave, right? yeah okay. so but but really you answered my question which was how connected you feel to oh, that yeah. point of light you know you made it so clear and that's why I have this point of light on the ground, so to speak, on the ISS above, so that people can say, hey, they're above me right now. Those people, us, we're all part of that, really. And uh, so I'm really excited to, to, to research more about your artwork. I think I it's- I put a link mm. uh, to the gallery called the Moon Gallery. And incidentally, yes. because uh, Space Price is about women in space, this I love this project because I do have a complaint here. If you go to Wikipedia and you type space artist, you see a list of men. Oh, no. And maybe one <laughs> woman, uh, Nicole Stott, but she's an astronaut. Mm -hmm. and no, no women on the Wikipedia page. So, and so this Moon Gallery, uh, basically, if you go online, is a list of about 100 artists. And more than half of us are women. So it's, uh, I just find this amazing. And the curators are women. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a great project. Brilliant. That link didn't, didn't work for me when I cut and pasted in. So I don't know if you want to double check it or, or 
copy it right. in. I'll send it again. Yeah, I saw something on LinkedIn. And Guillermo's but, got uh, his, his hand up too. Yes, yeah. he does. Yeah. And I'll I'll lower my hand, but uh, thank you. I thoroughly love your your response. Thank you. And Charles is saying he needs to head out. So thank you for joining us, Charles. Oh, I see. I put .edu. It's a reflex from my PhD days. It's just uh, <laughs> .edu. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll move on to, I'm sorry, Giuliano? Yeah. yeah. I pronounced that right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I don't know. I have a couple of questions, but maybe Motashan uh, has a, a, a question that is related to, to one of mine. So maybe he may go first. You want Deanna to go first? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't hear. I was thinking, who? Who? I don't who? want to spoil it. I don't <laughs> want to spoil it. Right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm... I don't want to spoil the question. You know. Sorry. I think he was maybe also inviting Matashim to share his question from the text chat. Yes. You're also a gentleman. Thank you for offering for me to go first. I appreciate that. So I have a big question. It's a big statement, but also a question that that really narrows it down, and it's really important to me because the students I work with. Um, are all students who come from all walks of life. Many of them don't have access to school programs that have anything yeah. to do with space because we do not have a space science program here in Canada, uh, unless you're perhaps in the universities. So yeah. we're going to the moon and Mars and that's happening now. Um, and mental health conditions are going to be challenged in a great way going forward. So we've got um, methods that we're using already that are helping with mental capacities like growing crops, uh, using guided imagery or virtual reality, but most importantly, strong levels of consciousness, uh, for example, being uh, key traits like the astronauts that are selected have open mindedness and they are needing to have this void of emotional connection filled when they go off to the moon and Mars because it's not like they're going to be able to look back as much as they used to, uh, especially with the gateway. And if we land on Mars, how are we going to keep them and their emotions stable? So what new methods, so we, know of the, we know of music, we know of plants, we know of those things, but what new methods of art are going to be brought to the future astronauts? And that's what I want my girls in STEM Genuity to work with. I want them to be able to try and answer that question. Uh, it's it's important. How do we survive in the future? And particularly for you, Priyanka, awesomeness, um, what ideas do you have that could actually contribute to that question, if any at all? Thanks. I think that's a great question. It's actually a question that's very relevant to our domain of artists. And um, yeah, so a lot of new tech has been explored. For example, AI is being explored for, you know, creating that sort of a connection, uh, like having a Siri on board, something of that sort. But also from the point of view of art, we were thinking of, you know, how if you could create like a hologram that learns, uh, you know, the traits of your, uh, of your loved one and you replay that. So it's not just like, be playing a recording we're actually able to interact with someone I, it's a bit creepy as a concept but then I guess people <laughs> no it's way cool it's very Star Trekian and bringing it into the to the future I think it's actually a really good idea I like that idea and there are also um it's it's also about you know selecting astronauts that appreciate this need for for you know being entertained in that in that way where you have to create something like take care of a plant etc that's also kind of very creative right because you have to you see this thing growing create a a link with it and i think these things are very important and lastly i wanted to add that in the beginning you mentioned uh, you know how it's going to be a very tough environment to live in so one of my questions here as an artist because the role of an artist is also to challenge existing uh, you know strategies is 
you have a bunch of people used to living in very comfortable environments trying to think of how you're going to live in an extreme environment for a long duration so why not in this case reach out and actually go study how people have been adapting to extreme environments in different parts of the world today like deserts or mountains or you know isolation isolated islands etc so and through when you study these cultures you also realize how important art is and how important it is to create to keep yourself you know feeling human and um, this and you know space is also like a great place where you can challenge a lot of the existing ideas that you have for example recently uh, uh, i was i attended a, a student conference where someone pitched the idea of you know on the moon you have lower gravity so you could even maybe play quidditch <laughs> in space <laughs> so you're going to have all kinds of uh, you know entertainment activities that are going to be influenced by these microgravity situations and yeah i mean imagination is the limit right because the sky is not That's the limit anymore great. great answers thank you i will take them back to the kids this <laughs> fall and mm -hmm. i love the idea of looking back at our earth because we forget that the answers are within yeah. <laughs> yeah. and we I often mean, look beyond before looking right in front of us <laughs> so i appreciate absolutely. that very much thank you I was going to chime in also Priyanka really quickly, and then I'll toss it to you, uh, Giammo, um, that uh, you and I have in common doing an analog astronaut experience, because I also did an analog astronaut experience, mm -hmm. and you touched on something that I learned very quickly there as well, that the, the people they select are going to have to be very well suited for this, yeah. because I learned very quickly about myself <laughs> that I, I can't go to Mars. Nope. Nope. <laughs> I, I did not do very well, even for a two week duration mission. Um, and I'm still kind of processing that. Uh, and I have to write about that at some point. Um, it, it did not go well for me, but I am like an extrovert communicator by nature. And mm -hmm. so to not be able to directly communicate with loved ones that that was really hard for me actually. Yeah. So anyway, let me toss it over to our next question. Okay, thank you. Well, actually, we share the same background. Uh, my, actually, my, my first uh, major was in music at Berkeley School of Music uh, oh. in songwriting and production. And then okay. I, you know, it, um, I moved to another stuff. Uh, space could be really a pretty hostile environment for art in general. Uh, music cannot be heard, you know, in near empty regions of space. Painting techniques, some techniques, the painting techniques are not being able to perform, you know, do my gravity environment. A sculpting in a space it will be really a, a challenge and a mess in, in my gravity conditions. Beyond being digital, how you envision art, of course, we, we, we have the digital, you know, tools, but art. Uh, has been uh, for a long, long time in human beings, um, a kinetic uh, discipline where you relate your hand with your brain, your senses. So uh, how to envision arts in that pretty hostile environment? That's my first question. And, and a side note on that question is, how do you avoid the bias in your creativity? Because our baby steps on a space, everybody, you know, is, is shooting a picture from the James Webb telescope, the moon, Mars surface, stars. But beyond that, when humans at the beginning of art try to mirror the nature, now are we trying to mirror the space in, in our creativity? How we avoid that bias in our evolution? So that's what, those are my two questions, please. Wow, I could do a second PhD on those two questions. <laughs> ah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, but they're great questions, right? And um, so uh, I'll give an example uh, that in France, there's this artist called Jeanne Morel, and she danced in zero gravity, in a microgravity flight to see, okay, on Earth, uh, when you're dancing, 
your foot has a normal reaction, which is pushing you upwards, etc. But in space, you don't really have that. So you have extra degrees of freedom, but despite that, you have a lot of constraints. You know, so it's it's kind of weird that you you feel like you can move anywhere, but then your center of gravity just stays where it is because there's no external force on it, etc. Going back to my physics here, but um, so yeah, it does open up new kinds of um, you know, ideas of what you can do. And today, I mean, you do send musicians to space, etc. And I think the art there is that they're doing, for example, Thomas Pesquet playing the saxophone, I think it was really for himself and not so much to communicate back to Earth. For me, even for me, art is sometimes a therapeutic uh, oh. way out of everyday life, you know. So a lot of what you create in space is going to be for yourself. You can, of course, communicate it to other people. If, uh, God forbid you're not alone in a capsule uh, heading to Mars <laughs> for six months. Uh, but then if you want to communicate back to Earth, it's going to be the same uh, signal transmission with more and more delay the further you go away from Earth. So that's also going to add more uh, constraints. But then the thing is, okay, now we're sending a certain kind of uh, profile to space. We're not really sending artists. So till you send people who can think like an artist, you will not know what, are, what kind of things you can do. So here my plea would be to send more artists in space. And maybe the, um, this is one thing I'm excited about for this entire space tourism thing is that um, it does give access to a lot of people and artists are going to be one of them. And so this is going to open up whole new avenues of how we think. And I'm very excited. Thank you very much for your answer. Yes. Yes, Mark. <laughs> oh, I, I wanted to see if I could squeeze in a question before the end too, but Priyanka, you mentioned to me the other day, well, I want to share an idea you had the other day. Priyanka uh, decided to ask if uh, if a piece of artwork could go on the zero G flight with the winner of the Paris contest, which I, I think is a fantastic uh -huh. idea. Uh, but you also mentioned, I think in the same conversation about curating a, um, it would exhibit, I'm not sure what the right word is, uh, uh, of space art for the Space Generation Advisory Council. I wonder if you could uh, talk yes. about that just real briefly. And then, we'll, then we do need to wrap up. So very quickly, so yeah, so for people who don't know SGAC, or Space Generation Advisory Council, it's an organization, like a, a branch of the UN, which represents the voices of young professionals and students in space up between the ages of 18 and 35. <laughs> with me promoting SGAC. And uh, so I'm part of their PR and comm team. And two, three lifetime ago, when I was, before COVID, when I was doing my analog uh, experience in Hawaii, uh, I, 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 was, I was kind of, at the, part, at the time I was part of this initiative called Our Giant Leap, which is again, once again, about women in aerospace uh, and especially the space industry. And I created some, some paintings and I was thinking of, you know, for our next event, it would be really cool to have a call for artwork to see uh, how people interact uh, with space through art. Because we organized an event uh, which was in person in Toulouse, Sony, mostly French people could attend, uh, attend it because of international barriers being shut. But then it was so touching to see people from all over the world submitting art, you know, about space, about women in space. It opened up entire avenues of thought that you cannot really, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words. So, and uh, so this was continued. Other uh, events also launched calls for art. And I realized that we don't really have a place to showcase it. So I'm curating an art gallery for this organization. So we decided to launch it online, which will be launched this year. And uh, the idea is to just showcase, because artists also need uh, a platform for visibility and everything just gets lost in your, the blocks of Instagram, et cetera. So we were hoping that this would give some visibility to all of these amazing art artists that contribute. So that was the idea behind the gallery. So cool. Yeah, I can't wait till you can share, share the link with everybody too. Yeah. Well, yeah. we- uh, At the we IEC, do... by the way. Yeah. What's that? 
Uh, oh, at IAC. IAC. Yeah. Hey, all right, all right. <laughs> All right. Well, I, uh, Sarah, thank you for, for coming and hosting. And Priyanka, thank you so much for coming and being our guest speaker. And uh, thank you to everyone. You. And I see your note, Liam. Thank you all for, uh, for coming and participating and asking such great questions and uh, sharing in the, in the chat as well. We had a great discussion today. Um, oh, uh, Liam is asking one final question. It's a good one to end on. Will you get the art back from the ISS? <laughs> yes, it's going to fly back, I think, in December. I'm not really sure of the exact mission yet, but it's going to come back. And the idea was that some of the artists wanted to study from a scientific perspective how their material changed. Because these are not paintings. They're actually like micro sculptures fit into one centimeter cube. So and cool. people wanted Whoa. to see how their material has reacted to microgravity, to radiation, etc. So that's, that's incredible. Back. That's incredible. science and art. <laughs> Science and science. Work, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I also need to say one other thank you uh, for posterity, but uh, really thanks to uh, Hannah Ashford and all the folks and Ellen over at uh, at the Carmen Fellowship, uh, where Priyanka was a fellow in uh, 2021, uh, because they made the introduction to you. So it's it's really <laughs> been a fruitful one to uh, to work with you in Paris and to to have you on uh, on the speaker series. Thanks. Thanks to. Yeah, Helen and Hannah as well for this opportunity. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording, but as usual, I'm happy to stick around a few minutes if anybody wants to stick around. But thank you again for uh, for being here, Sarah, and thank you, Priyanka, and thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you. Mm -hmm.